in here today. We hope you get some value out of this quick training, and we're going to open it up for questions, suggestions, and just live conversation on the mailbag episode, which is something we're going to do in this format now. I think every quarter we're going to invite listeners and friends to come to the show and just have a conversation. So, Court, if you could just unmute everybody, and we'll kind of get it going. Hey, Tim, this is Steve Euro. I got a question for you. Go for it, Steve. So with this time of uh, craziness uh, and reaching out to, as you said, everyone that uh, can be from a prospect to a customer or to a friend, is there, is there anything that you, um, from a messaging perspective, have you found anything that works best to uh, bring up proactively to just engage, start the conversation? You know, so what I'm seeing with the clients that you and I coach, right, and just in conversations with other people around the industry, is the first thing people are doing is they are just genuinely checking in, making sure that their business friends and even their business prospects are all okay. And it's actually been pretty amazing. Even over the weekend, I was getting texts and calls from you know, people I hadn't worked with or heard from in years, people that I'm close to all just making sure that everything's okay. So I think that's a great practice, as long as it's coming from a genuine place. The second thing is, is, depending on how well you know that person's business, ask them about their business conditions. There are a ton of industries right now that are scrambling to keep up, and it's not necessarily even the ones you would think about with people working from home, the IT security industry, the networking, the conferencing, and telecommunications are so so busy and there's so many more those just tend to be areas I know well because of history you know so get an understanding of what's going there and what about your use of um, I know you've sent me some things over the last couple of weeks that I found extremely uh, interesting I've actually passed those on is there any tips you have for sending any kind of information that might be benefit to people in this time of uh, chaos in our world so I, I think one of the great things you can do is truly communicate factual information related to their business, right? Not necessarily related to what you sell, but related to what's going on. So I know some of the things you and I have passed back and forth as an example are some analyst reports of industries that are doing well, right? So if you know you have a client that is in transportation or air freight right now, trying to move goods around and medical supplies specifically, right, is going to come become top priority. So if you have clients there and you're seeing any information about whether it's increased manufacturing and actual quantifiable output or speculation on where goods are going to need to go that's from a reputable source, I would share that with that client because they may have missed it, even if it's their own piece. Great, great. And now I only have one other, other question, and this is uh... – I always wrestle with this, but the use of appropriate humor. You know, I'm, a, I'm challenged by humor, right? Because I always want to walk that line. So personally, I tend to stay away from appropriate humor um, just because I, I, I know my tendency, right, is to be a, a little bit um, more ribald with mine. So, but I think, I think humor, humor in this time, especially if it's not directly related to the crisis at hand, I think is an okay thing. I think people need to laugh. I think it's good for us, right? You know, um, I don't know if you actually know this. I used to do stupid movie quotes days on Fridays. Do you know the story? No. So I actually used to spend every Friday morning trying to answer every question somebody asked me with a quote out of a B-rate comedy, probably from the 80s and 90s, because that's my bank of material. But there might have been some 70s and some early 2000s working too. So, you know, humor works for different people in different ways. That tends to be the way it works for me, right? I, I also, I don't necessarily send it out, but I do use a lot of self-effacing humor in, in talking to people just to make them comfortable with me. and I. You know, I think that's a personal style issue. Great. I also have a few questions. Go for it, Court. So just from working with certain salespeople, um, here's my first question. When you have a phone call number quota of calls you have to make, how do you make sure that those calls are still meaningful? 
So I'm, I'm going to give an answer, and I think I'm going to let Steve chime in on this one too, okay? So the first thing is, is look, pure number quotas, I understand the reason for them. I've run and managed teams with them. And I think part of that comes down to understanding, especially in a business-to-business selling environment. And a business consumer is a little bit different because I think that is more of a pure numbers game there. But in a business-to-business environment, I think the ability to determine who your best – first thing is – you got to determine how much time should you be spend calling existing customers and existing opportunities, existing customers and trying to generate new opportunities, and everything that's in between there, right? Closing out deals you have in quotes. Additional time trying to expand your contacts, because I think that is a place salespeople often overlook when they look at the calling quota, right? Oh, I know Steve, I'm going to call Steve. Steve has 15 other people in this company that do similar things to Steve. Why aren't we building relationships there? So that's another way to make sure you have quality calls in there. The next piece is, are you calling inactive customers, people that haven't bought for you in whatever way your company defines inactive? Some companies define it as years. Some companies define it as weeks. You know, I, I've always used a 60 or 90-day standard um, as a minimum and six months as a maximum. If a, you haven't talked to a customer, done a quota or interacted with them in six months, they're not a customer. Now, that was an industry-specific decision, right? Everybody's a little different. Um, how much time are you actually spending calling those customers? Because when it comes to call volume, if there's not an existing business relationship, you are going to end up in voicemail. And that's where you have to be effective with that voicemail. You have to leave a message that has a compelling reason for someone to call you back. And if you get them live, you've got about five seconds to keep their attention, right? Otherwise, they're going to be, no, thanks, I'm happy with who I've got. We've all done it. We all do it. And then finally, there's the true prospect calls. And that, that takes a special thick skin, right? And you could tell a great new business development person from – a not great or a terrible, freaking horrendous new business development person when the excuse for not calling is lead quality. If you have leads, numbers, calls, information, yeah, you gotta have a base set of things in hand. But if you have that and you can't dial the phone, the great ones dial the phone and they find a way to turn that into business, turn that into conversation. Yes, the odds or the percentages are low as a whole, but that's critically important to growing your business, building your book of business, you know, and helping drive sales at your company. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So I actually have a little bit of a follow-up on that. Go for it. So I know past coworkers, past friends of mine, some of them have been used to being completely remote, and that's how they run their business. Now, as far as people being forced to be remote, and this is a new way of business for them, how can they stand out from the crowd? End of the day, it's always results, right? So there's a beauty and a curse to being remote. And I'll use myself as an example. I've essentially been remote in everything I do for the last 15 years, whether it's remote at my home, or remote at my customer site, or remote at the nearest Marriott to wherever I am, right? So I've actually had a remote mentality, and part of that is is you need to make sure you're communicating up the food chain. Your boss doesn't need to know what you're doing every day, right? If you're a professional and you're doing your job, your results should speak for themselves. But make sure you get your reports in on time, make sure you're having a dialogue, and make sure you're leveraging them, not just to kiss their ass, frankly, right? But to really use them as a resource to help grow your business. And when you're remote, that's even more important. Thank you, I think that would be helpful. And then I actually have a question from someone that couldn't be on today. Okay, what's that question? So how do you handle, without being annoying, when a client says, I need time to think about it? So, Steve, I'm going to let you take the first shot at that one. So it's a delayed decision. What do you think? Uh, Number one, I respect that. So I respect the fact that they need time, and I might ask them uh, a simple question with a question that they pose to me or a statement they make, I need more time. Agree with them, say, I understand that. 
Uh, most people get back to me with the exact same thing. How much time? I'd answer that with another question of how much time do you think you need? Um, and it always goes back to court with the intent. So we're, if they do need time, we'll appreciate that. I don't have any closing tricks or, or uh, tips on that other than respect that they may need more time, clarify how much time they do need, and then follow up with an appropriate uh, correspondence to give them that time and then check in with them on that day that they agreed that they would, you know, that would be enough time. Um, get back to them on that simple day and, and over communicate um, against that expectation they set time wise. Awesome. Thank you. That's really helpful. That's all I have. All right. Head. All right. So just a couple things before we go. Upcoming episodes, so everybody's kind of got it on the roadmap. So we will have actually a three-part series with Barry Poulos, who is a corporate recruiter, specializes in salespeople. The first episode will be on how to prepare for a job interview, and the conversations that we had was fantastic. Uh, really talked about different points in your career, from new university grad, new entrant, to seasoned professional. The second part in that one that'll be out in the next few weeks as well was preparing specifically for a sales interview. And the third part of it is actually how to best work with a recruiter. Because recruiters, whether internal or external, open so many doors and so many opportunities inside a company. Um, also coming up, we will have Mike O'Neill on who has a great career. He's taught at the university level. He's worked at global financial companies and at telecom companies. He's talking about the importance of diversifying your revenue stream and specifically things to consider if you want to add services into a non-services business. So one-time services revenue as well as recurring services revenue. As always, you can reach me at tim at timkubiak.com or reply to us on our socials at Bowties and Business and Bowties and B-I-Z on Twitter with show ideas. We love hearing from our, all of our listeners. Appreciate the time and the feedback.